it is our reason for hope. It is also partly why, like my fellow travelers, some of whom are here with us in this hall, I am proudly Nigerian and will always remain one. My own journey into public life has taught me that while we must never as a people be complacent about our circumstances, there is also no noble project of national development and advancement that is beyond our grasp when we act as one with a clear vision, courage of conviction, and the requisite commitment. I began my journey into the public sphere as a student leader at the University of Lagos, at a time in our national history when we were all fired by genuine and well-founded hopes of the heights to which we could soar as a leading actor in global African and world affairs. It was the time in my personal journey when the roots of my unshakable faith were birthed that our future as a nation and our place in the global committee of nations resides in the consolidation of our unity and national cohesion. For it is out of unity and cohesion that we have always found the strength to transcend all barriers, defend our freedom and dignity, scale new heights, and provide leadership for others, especially in Africa. Beyond my early forays into the public sphere as a student leader, my abiding faith in the oneness of our country has been further reinforced by all my subsequent engagements in national affairs as a scholar, civil society voice and institution builder, community and political organizer with an unapologetic pan-Nigerian and pan-African outlook tireless advocate for human rights and democratic governance, as a two-term governor, a federal cabinet minister, the founding coordinator of the Progressive Governors Forum, and two-term chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum. I have been privileged to witness firsthand the underlying commitment and sense of solidarity which Nigerians from all parts of our country share about the promise of our fatherland. And it has been my singular honor to have been active, to have been an active part at various times with other committed compatriots from various walks of life, laboring with determination towards rapid and sustained national progress. Dear compatriots, it is in the spirit of this abiding faith in our country and the promise of its unfinished greatness that I stand before you today in total humility and with all sense of responsibility to solemnly declare to all within our party and Nigerians at large my decision to accept my name to be put forward for consideration by the All Progressive Congress leadership and membership as our party's standard bearer in the upcoming contest for a successor to our leader, President Muhammad Buhari. This is not a decision which I have taken lightly. Indeed, to arrive at this point, I carried out a long and deep self-introspection with the help of my wife, Bisi, and other family members, my friends, my political associates and professional colleagues. I have also traversed the length and breadth of our country to consult and explore with our esteemed elder statesmen and women, traditional rulers, a cross-section of party leaders, and rank-and-file members of our great party, 
and various non-partisan leaders of thought and opinion. I embarked on these outreach visits, neither with any prior assumptions about what they would yield, nor with any sense of personal entitlement. However, after a careful consideration of where we are as a nation, and the many perspectives which are emerging about the challenges, old and new, which we must tackle and transcend, I am convinced that my entry into the race will offer our members and Nigerians the opportunity to examine competing visions for national rebirth in the best interest of our country. What advice are we giving our president? Um, first, let me say that maybe because I'm privy to some things that may not be easy to reveal publicly. The president of Nigeria, President Buhari is really, really doing a lot on security. Yes, you are interested more in outcome rather than input, but there is a lot that the government is doing that the government cannot even talk about at times. However, there are also areas of impediments that we need to tackle quickly. If you ask me, and I've had cause to share some of this with our principal officers in, 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 in the security sector, given my background that you spoke about. First, this country was able to recruit in an emergency manner in 1967. It moved from an army of 10,000 to 250,000 within a space of one year. Today, there are all sorts of bureaucratic impediments that are not allowing us to expand the men and women that we have in the armed forces and in the police. And we need to do that quickly. If we're not able to do that in the shortest possible time by clearing away those bureaucratic impediments, we need to bring on board our reserve elements who are still on duty. Our soldiers, even in retirement, they are on duty. Major generals, colonels, brigadiers, they're all over the place. Electricity, for me, I think the solution is it's time to do away with a national grid. We now need to begin to look seriously in the direction of zonal or regional grids, or even micro and mini grids outside of the mainstream official uh, uh, national uh, energy grid. It's the only way to, to solve this problem and focus our energy on renewable energy as well. We, if we don't do that, it's band-aid or bullet wounds. This national grid is completely broken and fixing it every day it crashes is a problem that we cannot easily uh, uh, tackle. Uh, on employment, I did speak to that, but for me, it is not the job of government to start focusing on, 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 on employment. But it is our job to provide the enabling environment for private sector to thrive, for the agricultural sector to thrive, for the infrastructure sector that we have to create jobs. And there are so many jobs tied to these various critical segments of our economy. That is what we need to do. Uh, in addition to addressing questions of skills, because we talk about employment. Majority of our young people don't have the requisite skills to do the job that is necessary to do. We need innovation, we need creativity, we need technology, we need skills. In addition to providing the enabling environment or to allow this to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.